Now, for UMBC, I'm Steve Hardiman, your moderator. I am an alumnus of UMBC, and it is good to be back. A special welcome to all you educators. Thanks for your service. For many years, learning theorists and practitioners work to refine the craft of teachers, trainers, and educators, but they overlooked something that was right under their nose. According to our guest today, formal learning, classes and workshops, is a source of only 10 to 20 percent of what we learn at work. He says workers learn more in the coffee room than in the classroom, and that you and I discover how to do most of our jobs by observing others, trial and error, and simply working with people who are in the know. By ignoring that 80 to 90 percent of learning opportunities, organizations overinvest in formal training programs while neglecting the natural, simpler, informal processes. Your host and creator of the ISD Now webinar series is Greg Williams. Hey, Greg. Greg, you might be muted there, so try, go ahead and unmute your mic. Unmuted. Hello, muted. Steve. There we go. Whoops, you're muted again, Greg. All right. Unmuted. I'm going to go ahead and intro Greg. Dr. Okay. Greg Williams. There we go. Hi, Steve. Sorry. <laughs> No problem. Dr. Greg Williams is the director of UMBC's graduate program in instructional systems design. And he also teaches in the program as a clinical assistant professor. He has over 25 years experience as a faculty member, instructional designer, e-learning developer, project manager, and consultant in education, business, and for the federal government. Now, Greg, today is the official, I guess, grand opening of the ISD Now series. and we're kicking it off with informal learning. So I guess we're breaking with tradition right out of the box. Uh, how does today's topic fit into your vision of what we can expect in the ISD Now series? Well, Steve, that's a great question. Um, we started something in 2004 called the UMBC Training Forum, which was an in-person event. And my goal with that event was to present relevant professional type information to people in uh, workplace learning, instructional design, e-learning training, and more. And as the years went on, it just seemed natural that we just extend that to an online format. So I, I think today's topic is just um, a great kind of uh, stamp on what we're doing. And we're just trying to you know, extend what we're doing to an even broader market. You will have a chance to let us know the kind of topics you'd like to see later. We'll, there'll be an evaluation after the event. We'd love to hear your ideas as well. Uh, speaking of getting some ideas, Greg, we've got to, let's go ahead and uh, run our first poll. And Greg's going to be putting that up. And since informal learning is kind of young, we'd like to get your opinion of what you think its prospects are for the future. So uh, once you see the poll on your screen, you can go ahead and there you go, and go ahead and cast your vote as to whether you think that it's uh, in 10 years we're not going to be hearing any more about informal learning or if it's here to stay. And while you're voting, here's how you can get the most out of today's webinar. To ensure a smooth audio and video, it's important to close any other programs that you have open. So if you have any other web browsers, documents, or email programs open, you can go ahead and close those now. And second, the only ground rule today is that if you have a question, you have to ask. So if you grab your mouse, I'll show you how to ask questions. On the right-hand side of your screen where you see the GoToWebinar console, and if you've minimized it, go ahead and open it back up. You'll see one of the frames in blue is labeled chat. And you might have to click the triangle to the left of the word chat to open it. But it's there that you're, you're in that frame that you're going to, going to submit your questions. And so that we can all learn from each other, whatever you type there will be seen by everyone. So everybody's going to sort of share each other's questions and be able to see them. Uh, but there are a lot of people with us today, so it could get really crowded. So our only request is that you limit yourself to the, to questions about today's topic for the presenter, you know, as a courtesy. And you can save your editorial comments and rants for the Facebook uh, Facebook wall and uh, LinkedIn community. So Greg, let's go ahead and uh, push the results out there and see what uh, see what okay. our results are. 
All right. Well, any surprises for you? Well, uh, we might have a biased audience, and I mean that in a good way, but it looks like uh, the majority, over 80%, uh, think it's either important or very important. We have a couple, 2%, that think it's a fad, and some people not sure yet. But it looks like the majority of our, of our audience thinks it's either important or very important. The natives are friendly today. It's good. All right. You ready to get started, Greg? Yes, sir. All right. Well, let's introduce our very special guest today, who's Jay Cross. Hi, Jay. Hi. Jay Cross is an evangelist of informal learning, the social web, and systems thinking. He's also a provocateur who challenged traditional notions of how adults learn when he designed the first business degree offered by the University of Phoenix. He was, he was CEO of eLearning Forum for its first five years and is the current chair of Internet Time Alliance, helping corporations foster collaboration and accelerate productivity through learning networks. He's a graduate of Princeton University and Harvard Business School, and you may know him best as the author of the book, Informal Learning, Rediscovering the Natural Pathways to Inspire Innovation. Uh, Jay, I was very encouraged by the poll results. You know, you're, you're known as the sort of Johnny Appleseed of informal learning. And uh, since no, very few people seem to think informal learning was a fad, we don't have to change that to the Don Quixote of informal learning, which is good news. How did you get started and get interested in informal learning? Well, actually, it was right after 9-11. I was talking with a fellow Hooper's from the Institute for Research on Learning, which is a Xerox-funded effort right across the street from the park. And he laid out this figure that 80% of the way people learn their jobs, and this studies by anthropologists who get stopwatches, was informal. I thought, well, hold it. I've been in the training racket for 30 years. What Have I been wasting my time? So I spent more time with them at their place in Menlo Park and slowly realized, well, yeah, I didn't learn as much in classes in school as I thought. When I really look at stuff, I, I learned a lot of it from watching other people, from screwing up and figuring out how to do better. So uh, I just found that very intriguing, especially since nobody was paying any attention to informal learning. Reminds me of the expression, fish discover water last. It was just, it, we're enveloped in this informal learning and don't realize that, that we're doing it all the time. And so we you know, overlooked it and, and spent too much time formalizing it. OK, we're going to go ahead and pass the presenter control over to you, Jay, so you can get started. And a quick reminder to everyone that Jay is looking forward to answering your questions throughout. So we're not going to wait until the end. So use the chat frame to submit your questions. And we'll take our first Q&A break in just a few minutes. All right, Jay, the floor is yours. All right. Just a minute. We'll get there. Kaboom. Do people see clouds? Steve, you see clouds? I see clouds. I hey, see clouds. Oh. Well, folks, we're in the cloud now. We know that's, that's trendy. <laughs> uh, all right. I, I, I was thinking, you know, we've got so many people attending this. I don't want to go through the standard, here's what informal learning is, basics. Uh, I've had some fresh thoughts on it. And I want to present those. I'm going to talk about something called a workscape. And I'm going to try to sort of get into some more practical aspects of what do we do with informal learning if we do believe it's out there. Now, at the outset, I should say that these aren't all my ideas. Uh, I learn a lot from the web. I learn a whole lot from the people I work with because we sort of banded together first to learn from one another. And secondly, we occasionally team up on projects and think about things together. So you, you can find out about that at the URL. I'm not going to go into it anymore. But I've, I've stolen some ideas from Jane and Harold and Clark. And, you know. Here's what I want to cover. Convergence of work and learning, which I see happening increasingly. Ten dirty words. The shift from formal to informal. And that's the shift for everybody as they sort of grow into their profession. Various activities of formal and informal, how you can spot one from the other, how to bring the two together, how business is organized and where should 
we be working as a result? A little bit on communities of practice, how you start, cost-benefit, and elevator pitch. That's more than we have time for. So I'm going to adopt the uh, open space principle that when it's over, it's over, and whatever we cover is what we're supposed to cover. But we won't tarry long. This is all about change. The way I see the world, I don't think we've just come through an economic downturn. I think we're at the very beginning of a phase change in civilization. The industrial age is passing, and with it, the certainty of sort of Newtonian mechanics, and uh, for every action, there's an opposite equal reaction and stuff like that, and more into a, an age of relativity, an age uh, essentially of Einstein and Niels Bohr, where things are unpredictable. Things are so complex and interacting with one another that you can no longer be certain of the future, which makes our jobs as instructional designers a little tough. Back in the age of certainty, say beginning around World War II, we entered what I call the golden age of training. I mean, America had to train four million people to shoulder rifles and go to war. We had no standing army when World War II began. And this gave us sort of a legacy of training as something aside from work. First you go to basic training, then you go to the field. I hate to interrupt you. Um, we're still sure. seeing blue blue sky, and I'm not sure if you ah. changed your slides, but we're. Um, I've we're changed still in the slides clouds. five times. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, it's always something, isn't it? You're um, engaging. I'll tell you. I was I was I was hooked on every word. We just figured there's probably visuals for this. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to you know impromptu do a little something. Can you see now a? Yeah. All sure right, can. I'm going to. I have to resize this a little bit. Yeah, when I, them, yeah, we'll have go. to tell our friends at Citrix that when you uh, punch up the whole screen, it obliterates things. Now, let me move this off a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. Oh, right, in the Mac version. Yeah, we'll have to. And I'll, I'll show you what you missed. I mean, we missed the, I'm going to talk a little bit about workscapes as well, and that these are my colleagues, and you can find out about them. And, in fact, this is a news feed from the Internet Time Alliance. I doubt if anybody kept up with the agenda without a list, but <laughs> these are the things we're going to go through. I was talking about change, and this is where you told me that everybody was looking at clouds. I guess people thought this was a very zen presentation. So training had been separate from work, and now what we see happening is training, learning is becoming much more important. Because the world's going faster, there's more to learn. And also, work and learning are starting to converge. So we're getting something that looks more like this. And this is what I call a workscape. It's looking, sort of taking a holistic systems view of what's going on, rather than what we used to do, which is sort of look at individual pieces. We used to look at training programs. Now we're looking at learning platforms. So we're in the midst of this transition. And I'll tell you that I don't expect this to be easy. Uh, there's no magic dust around this one. It's going to be like this guy. I mean, we're going to have to take some risks. Uh, we're not all going to make it to the other side. Um, it'll be quite a journey. Now I'm going to switch to the dirty words. Some of you probably remember this guy, George Carlin. George was an irreverent comedian, and he had a skit about the words you couldn't say on television. Uh, a lot of these are four-letter words. I mean, there was a reason you couldn't say them on television. But just taking from him, I wrote a thing for Chief Learning Officer magazine on words that you shouldn't say to somebody who's not one of us, Some, words you shouldn't use with an executive, for instance. Words like learning, learner, social, informal, KM, training, e-learning. And you think, what? Can't use those? No. They, these are words that are loaded. They have baggage. They get you in trouble. At the beginning of a lot of this stuff, I wrote a book on implementing e-learning. 
I don't use the term e-learning anymore. It's meaningless. It was grabbed by vendors. Uh, anybody with a modem said they had e-learning. So that's confusing. Now, even though I wrote the book on it, I, I don't talk about informal learning because people get confused and they think that informal means sort of haphazard or random. And that's, that's really not the case at all. I mean, I, I think of it more as honest, authentic, tell it like it is. But I don't want people to get the wrong idea. So I'm, I've been dropping the informal learning. And I don't even like learning because you mentioned learning to an executive. And she thinks school. And school was not very efficient. So it's not on my dime. So my latest book, I took the informal learning title away. I just call it Working Smarter. Because I figure people have a difficult time saying, we don't want to work smarter. I mean, they can say, we don't want informal learning, even if they don't know what it is. But everybody wants to work smarter. And to get into the topic, I like to put examples first and only then later get into explanations. Examples like at DevLearn this year, Mark Ehlert was uh, making a presentation in the uh, social media camp. And a fellow sitting there worked in the wind turbine business, these great big windmills. These things are gigantic. I mean, it helps to have mountain climbing skills to work on the, the works that are inside. And they're very high tech as well. They stop turning, company stops making money. Guy heard about Yammer, which is like a Twitter behind the firewall. Called the president of his company that night and said, you know, we might be able to use this. Our people are, you know, up on the blades to be able to help one another, to share information. And they'd be able to spot things that, you know, are going to need maintenance in the future. And when he called the president the next night, the fellow said, well, I, I've already installed this. Um, we're going to have it operating on Monday, and it's going to save us three to five million dollars annually. I mean, how can you fight with that? You spend ten thousand, you get three to five million back. Then you can say, "Oh, well, it's user-generated content; it's informal learning." If if I look at CGI, which is a very astute consulting firm that installs telephone systems internationally, they're headquartered in Canada. They realized that 4,000 of their top people were each doing their own research to keep up with the field. They're reading blogs. They're going to conferences. They're reading journals and all this stuff. They said, hold it. There are really about a dozen specialties that one has to keep up with. We'll appoint the, sort of the, one of the most respected people in each of those specialties to be the central point for gathering the news. And people can send them tips where we're less likely to meet things, miss things. They uh, didn't want to turn their, their folks into writers, which would have taken a while. So they assigned each of them a writer who would create two blog posts a week to send out to everybody who was interested in a particular subject, say computer security. This saved all the duplicate effort of people each doing their own research. And I figure it cut at least 8,000 hours out of the uh, research that they were doing, expanding their capacity by more than $25 million a year by taking the individual learning and consolidating it. I mean, hard to fight with things like this. Um, few more, we have uh, P&G is outsourced 50% of its R&D. They crowdsource a lot of things now. Best Buy, you may have seen the ads on TV where, you know, they're, they're, they're tweeting to a whole crowd in a stadium. Well, you know, at Best Buy, you don't get one of these jobs unless you've got at least 150 followers on Twitter. I mean, they want people who understand and sort of live and breathe Web 2.0 to be involved. Now, I want to get to a few underlying principles. This fellow is Hans Mondermann. Hans was a traffic engineer, worked in the Netherlands, 
And most traffic engineers put up signs, have lines painted in the road, uh, put up little barriers and things like that. And Hans didn't think that was very effective. Why? Well, I don't know about you, but when I see a sign that says speed limit 50, and there's a curve coming up, I figure, well, I better take it down to 65, maybe 60. So it, it doesn't really <laughs> control my behavior at all. It, makes, it gives me limits that I can go past. Whereas if I'm coming into a turn, it's a blind turn, and there's no sign, I'll probably slow down at 35. I don't want to you know, get a big surprise. So what Hans does, which is different, is he eliminates the lines and the signs and all that and creates places where people can act human. I mean, if, if you're coming up on a, a place like the one in the bottom here with a crosswalk, and you see somebody crossing in the middle of the block, it's sort of, ah, well, they're breaking the law. I can just see if I can skirt past them. Whereas if there are no lines at all, you establish eye contact and you act like a human. I mean, you slow down for a pedestrian. So Hans didn't treat people like drivers. He treated them like people. And I don't think we ought to treat people like learners, because we're the only one who calls them learners. No, these are workers. They're bankers. They're salespeople. They're whatever. But don't call them learners. Uh, again, this is advice for talking with executives. They won't get it if you call them learners. People have asked me if I mind uh, the fact that a number of people are borrowing my words from the informal learning book. Actually, I'm sort of flattered by that. But I'm not excited at all about people who don't take the case any further. People who act like it's a big revelation to repeat something that was written five years ago. I, I'm a little later on. We're going to get to some stuff that nobody's ever seen before, some fresh thinking. But some folks, in fact, lots of them, so I won't pick any one out so much, are wasting a whole lot of our time talking about formalizing informal learning. I mean, it, at first it's sort of a, oh, hey, paradox, great, you know? And it, it's not one outfit that's doing this. Everybody seems to be doing this, <laughs> except me. Uh, so we're inundated with all this formalized informal learning. Actually, it, it's sort of a mistaken word game they're playing. They're not talking about formalizing the learning because that's the way to kill initiative. They're talking about institutionalizing informal learning. They're recognizing, what I've contended for a long time, that informal learning is too important to let it just happen at random. There are things you can do, which we'd be looking at, to support e-learning and to make it more effective. Remember, it's not that you're making a choice to bring in informal learning. You've already got informal learning going on. The question is whether it's done well or whether it's sort of struggling along. Now, we better define what I'm talking about. Oh, somebody comment? Yep. Jay, I just want to, it's a good time to take a couple of questions, if this is a, sure. a segue. Um, before we get to that, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we are strongly encourage your questions. We'd love to hear what's on your mind. And you can, if you've joined us since we started, the way that you submit a question is in the chat area. If you look on the, the GoToWebinar control panel, you have to pull that out if you've minimized it. There's a chat frame uh, that's labeled there, white text on blue. And you may have to expand it, but just type your questions in there, and we'll get them, and we'll relay them to Jay on one of these breaks that we're going to take during uh, while we're doing this. Uh, but Greg, do you have a, a question for Jay? Greg, you have to unmute. Jay, this is Greg Williams. Yep. Um, I talk to a lot of people in our field, especially employers, and what they're always looking for are practical ideas. And a lot of them will say, all right, I understand the concept of this informal learning thing, but how do I apply it in my company, in my business, in my organization? You know, they're, they're looking to actually take the idea and then turn it into something that, that, that can be used. Are, are people looking too hard? Are they missing the boat? Or what, what's your reaction to that? Well, there are a lot of new ideas. And there's, there's no reason that they have to all be invented at home, essentially. I mean, we're talking about things like 
these examples. So at last night, I figured, well, I'll hold it. You know, we need to cover a lot of examples, but we don't have time today. So at the end of this, I'm going to give people a URL to go to a new white paper, and it lists a number of ways that organizations are using informal learning and social networking to improve the bottom line. So I'm, I'm not surprised at all. It's, you know, it's something we haven't looked at. Okay. Which also means that unlike most other business processes, which have been rechanneled, re-engineered, TQM, Sigma, everything else until there's nothing left to squeeze out, this is virgin territory. I mean, that's why you can get these things that, you know, make a million dollars easily because nobody's done it before. Other questions? Well, I, I think that's, that's a good start. I mean, I think what, what I've heard is, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'm in the training business. How do I control this informal learning? Because, you know, I need to show my boss how I'm making a difference, and I can't get a hold of this informal learning thing. So what, what's, what's going to happen to, you know, who's, who's in control of this function? How do we manage this, so to speak? And I'm, I'm kind of being a little bit facetious. Yeah, well, I mean, you don't control it. I, I my take is that control is largely an illusion, uh, but even so, I mean, the idea is that we're giving control to the individual learners, and uh, I, I have faith that people will come through. We'll we'll get into that real soon because that's an important distinction. Okay. And it it, it is something that's tough for traditional organizations to get their arms around. In fact, it comes into the very description of what is formal versus informal. And it, it's not one thing. These are, these are points on a continuum. Okay, It's not that there's informal learning and formal. There are all kinds of in-betweens on this. Now, just to be true to what I've been saying, I've got to cut out the word learning here. There's sort of a spectrum of getting things done and how you figure them out. And the formal is more old school things are pushed at you, and the informal is more user choice, you pull things in. Although, there's, there's room for both of these. I mean, both are, are necessary orientations to get along. In ways, the formal is a top-down, the informal is a bottom-up. Here, the formal, you've got the control, but you don't in the informal. That's the deal. There's a lot of self-service that's going on on the informal side. Now, as far as labeling, I don't care that much about labeling, but I care about having choices in how I design things. I can look at where does the subject matter come from? Is it from the organization or is the individual pick it? I, I can look at, am I covering a whole framework, a new thing, sort of a, a, a new language, a new subject, or am I just trying to fill in the holes in the knowledge I've already got? I mean, I, I'm not going to suggest that somebody should, like, learn algebra by hanging out at the water cooler. They would be there forever. That's the type of thing where formal classes make a whole lot of sense. But after you've got it, after you're using it, if there's one little element you need, well, you ask somebody. You don't go back and take a course. Um, formal tends to bolster knowledge, whereas informal is often wrapped up with doing something. Other characteristics, and I can let you go through these things on your own. We'll give you a copy of the slides, but essentially, formal usually takes a while. I mean, you're trying to cover a lot of ground, so you're talking hours or semesters or something, whereas informal tends to be smaller packets. None of these are absolutes, but this is the average case that we're talking about. And sort of, what's the purpose? Well, the purpose of formal might be to learn banking regulations or learn how the bank works. And the purpose of informal is to become a better banker. And there's a, a subtle twist there, but I think an important one. Now, I want to cover 
sort of the life cycle of some of these things. When somebody's a novice, they don't know the field, most of their learning is going to be formal. I mean, they're, they're trying to get their arms around the whole subject. They're trying to see the big picture. And I, I liken it to riding on a bus. I mean, it's not personalized. If you're hungry, the bus isn't going to stop for you. And frankly, you get there if you fall asleep. But it's, it's sort of we're all in it together, and there's a schedule. Often there's recognition. I mean, when I get to the end of the line and learning, I get a grade or a gold star or a check mark in an LMS, but there's recognition that, all right, this little phase is over. And as somebody grows in their career and in their knowledge, informal becomes more important because they are looking just for those short little hits. And they're doing it, it's more like riding a bicycle. They're doing it on their own. If they get hungry, they stop at a restaurant. If they decide, well, I'm a little off course here, they change the direction. I live on a steep hill in Berkeley. It's like I'm looking way down at the Bay Bridge now. And every weekend there are hundreds and hundreds of bicyclists in tight little spandex uniforms huffing and puffing their way up the hill. And when one of them breaks down, the next bicycle stops to help. And that's the type of thing that we try to foster in an effective learning culture. That if I'm trying to figure something out, everybody else is there to help me. Now, we see that this is sort of progression where informal becomes more important over time. And there's sort of a built-in trap that a lot of us have fallen into. We're used to school, which is by and large formal. There's some informal in there, but by and large formal. And a lot of our design methods uh, more or less assume formality, that I'm going to do an analysis, I'm going to come out with subject matter, I'm going to uh, give it to people uh, and push it on them and see if they got it. So we're quite comfortable with that type of methodology. I mean, any instructional designer is familiar with putting together, you know, the bus rides of life. But we're not very equipped to put together the bike rides. Well, that's sort of somebody else's job. It hasn't been ours. So as a result, we've been concentrating on the novices. This is what most training departments do. They provide learning opportunities for people who are seen as somehow deficient or unskilled or whatever, and they bypass the opportunity to work with the practitioners who are the people who are actually making money for the firm. And this leads to the uh, paradox that most of our spending is for formal learning and most of the learning is informal. The uh, Informal learning, it, it's not that you bring in this new and alien stuff. It's that you recognize that a lot of learning does go on through conversation. It's natural. It's human. It just happens. It doesn't have a, well, you're through with the course. I mean, it, it's not completed. A lot of people have fun with it. Uh, I love to learn things, but I hate to be taught things. There are certain activities which naturally go for either the novice or the experienced practitioner. Here's a list. We know the formal. It's workshops. It's classrooms. It's instructor-led training. And we know the informal, the conversations, just being able to find people with expertise, uh, trial and error, asking questions, uh, trying on a job for size for a while, collaborating with others, uh, forming study groups. That's in business school. I learned more in my study group than I did in case discussions. And that, there's, there are also the things that sort of fall in the middle. I mean, mentoring, it can be mandated, but the subject matter may be the spur of the moment. Uh, the, the simulation, you can be told, you take this simulation and you've got to come out with it or something or other score, but the way you get there is going to be different from the way other people got there. So those are the types of activities. Now let's say I've got a situation, and a lot of people ask me about this, where I've currently got 
some things that are 100% formal. So we're going to have this workshop on compliance issues, and we go through them and then take a test. And folks say, well, you know, it's, it's mandated. I mean, what else can you do? Well, it's mandated that you sit in a seat for a while and you take the test, but it hasn't been mandated that you remember and apply what you learned. And there are things that fight against that, in fact. I mean, if John Medina and Brain Rules tells us that if we don't deem something as relevant, we're not going to be very good at learning because it's dull, it's boring. We say, well, what's with that? And a lot of people don't see why they should have to sit through compliance tests. The lady in the picture is Bluma Zygarnik, the first professor of psychiatry at the University of Moscow, but a stu student of Kurt Lewin, who came up with a thing that if you have a formal closure, like you've taken the test now, often that's a signal to the mind to forget stuff. You're through with that. And uh, you talk to people after they've taken a compliance test, you know that's true. And, and finally, there's Hermann Ebbinghaus. And Professor Ebbinghaus found that if you don't reinforce it, what you learn disappears at an exponential rate. Now, what can we do about that stuff on the right? I'll suggest that we can wrap the mandated formal learning experience within formal learning, before and after. It might be something like this. Or in the beginning, get the team together and say, well, why is it important to know this? Let's say I'm a banker and I'm looking at uh, currency regulations. Well, it, it might be that you know there's a lot of drug traffic down the street, and if somebody comes in with a $200,000 deposit, rather than look at that as an opportunity to score a giant bonus, we could look at that as likely to be drug money, and besides, you're not allowed to take a cash deposit that large. Hey, Jay? Then, uh, yeah. Is this a, did you want to complete a point there, or is this a good time to um, take questions? Uh, wait a minute. You got look, it. Because we've got a natural, <laughs> Bluma would hate this, we have a natural break coming up in a moment. <laughs> I was going to say, that's not the Zygarnik method. <laughs> <laughs> I like people's ahead. mind intention. This never ends. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after the workshop, you can have a brown bag lunch and just talk about things. Or you can send people notice, you know, that some character at uh, Chase was arrested yesterday for, t you know, money laundering because they, you know, broke the regulation. Or, you know, if you look at some learning experiences, say sales training at IBM, I'm convinced that at least half of the benefit comes from the alumni network, which is set up during the formal training. I mean, people who go through this together, they're like fraternity brothers or sorority sisters. This is who you call up in other divisions to find things out. Now, one more thought, and then we'll, we'll stop for a little bit, take the breather. It used to be that businesses concentrated on employees, that you had to be a full-time employee to qualify for training. I mean, we didn't train temps. We didn't let outsiders pass the corporate walls. And yet now, businesses network. Businesses are in, part of an ecosystem of larger things. And I think we have to consider opportunities to help our customers learn, to help our partners learn, because we're interested in the whole equation. I took a survey of 200 chief learning officers, and I found that two-thirds of them don't think it's their job to deal with the learning of, uh, cut that guy off, to deal with the learning of customers or the learning of partners or people in the supply chain. And folks, I, I think we've, you know, it's a profession. We've been missing it for a while. And now, I'm up for question. So why you, if you, you were just on that, yeah, we were just on that continuum that came up there, and someone asked a question about where something fits. Uh, and it was uh, Jim who asked the question, he said, Jay, how do you rank some self-help resources, you know, such as lynda.com in terms of formal and informal learning? And for those not familiar with it, that's on-screen, you know, uh, computer-based training. Um, so where does that fit in your continuum so you can start to understand this better? 
Well, it, you know, it, there's not a single point that you come up on the curriculum, on the continuum. There are all these different things. So if it's self-study, if it's something that I'm doing on my own, nobody told me to do it, and uh, I'm driven by either curiosity or just, you know, want to uh, improve my repertoire of skills, well, then it's informal. Now, if somebody says, hey, look at this YouTube video. This is important and will improve your customer service skills. Well, it's the same video, and I may watch it while I'm in my pajamas whenever I feel like, but it's been mandated. So it, it's somewhere in between. The idea is not to label things as much as it is to pick what feels appropriate to make the learning happen. Instructional designers are challenged more than ever before to make all these little choices. It's not just, here's what they got to learn, and here's the design to get it across. No, it's looking at the environment in which this is going to happen. And that often determines what the mix looks like. Jay, this is Greg. I I have a, there's a lot of questions that are that are coming in right now, so I'm going to jump in and ask one if you don't mind. That people sure. are uh, chatting in. Uh, this is from um, Jim, and Jim's asking: Some corporate cultures have a hard time allowing staff to learn at their desk. Can Mr. Cross give some examples of corporate cultures that support the time necessary for informal learning without penalizing staff with effectively requiring extra hours? to make up for this time of the working at their desk? <laughs> well, I mean, in the very beginning, the culture issue is um, whether it's an enlightened organization or not. And often I think of it uh, more as the sort of industrial school of learning uh, is the one that's concerned about uh, timing, things like that. I mean, it used to be that production was a function of how many hours you put in. And if you were really good at your job, maybe you were 20% faster than uh, the standard. Well, that's not true anymore. Intangibles are more important than tangibles. And when Google's hiring, they look and they say, well, if we get a really exemplary engineer, that individual is likely to be 200 times more effective than just our standard. And their standard is pretty high. So it may be that somebody, you know, only works for 10 minutes a month. But in those 10 minutes, they're inventing new ideas that can be patented or new ways to conquer the market. And uh, it would be crazy to say, well, hold it. You've got to be thinking up ideas all the time. Forget all this stuff you do that sort of generates the ideas, you know, because that's not directly measurable work. A lot of companies don't get this. And frankly, with some of the companies I've been to, if I were a member of their staff and I saw the type of disrespect of employees going on, fear that they were just going to goof off if they had some discretion, I'd quit. I mean, there are other places to work. And an organization like that is just going to get trashed in the future when more and more things are delegated to the individual workers. So it's a giant issue, uh, oh. no question. OK. All right, here's, here's another one. Um, this is from Stuart Weinstein. Um, when I think of informal learning, I consider raising children. This has been going on for hundreds of years before we had a formal name for it. Um, on a, when a child or an adult gets burned on a stove, they add to their knowledge and what things do. Um, on another note, with the internet, everyone being a self-proclaimed author, expert, publisher, but without review or accuracy relevance. So if informal is great, if results are reliable, um, otherwise outcomes may be confusing or misleading. Your thoughts, Jay? Well, there's several. I mean, uh, I, I use the, the children thing a lot. I was talking with the senior vice president of IBM who was in charge of all their educational relationships. And he comes up to me, this is three or four years ago, and says, well, how do I know that informal learning works? And I said, well, how did you learn to talk? How did you learn to stand up? I mean, it, <laughs> it, it doesn't take too much reflection to 
figure that one out. Now, the reliability thing, look, it ain't just stuff on the web. I mean, there's weird stuff out on the web, but there are a whole lot of weird books and libraries. There are magazine articles, which are total nonsense. There are TV shows purporting to be documentaries. There are, you know, people in Texas who think that, uh, you know, creationism's the way to go. There's, there's no absolute truth telling. You have to be cautious. I think part of the learning has to be evaluating the veracity of the source. Uh, <laughs> jokingly, uh, I, I've had people say that, you know, well, you, you can't know like you know in school. And I say, well, hold on, did you go to a religious school? And if they say, yeah, I say, you believe all that? And most of the time, well, mm, uh, you know, uh, sort of hem and haw, maybe not. Uh, so there's some things that a new initiative, like let's look at informal learning, bring to the surface that are societal issues, cultural issues, not having to do with the way, you know, people learn things. Okay, thanks. Jay, I'll let you continue with your uh, presentation, and then we'll take some more questions towards the end. I just wanted to get a few questions um, uh, flowing there. Sure, so sure. back to you. Well, and and I, I think we get a lot more from questions just because they show, you know, it, it's more of a, a partnership. It's a conversation. Uh, so what I want to do is I'm going to quickly give you the end, and then we're open for questions. And if we, if we have a law, well, we can go back and catch some of this stuff. I'm going to skip over communities of practice, how you begin. Um, well, I'll, I'll hit some cost-benefit, because I think that's important. And then I'll, I'll share some resources. Cost-benefit. There is more total crap written about this topic. <laughs> it's, it's a time that you do have to look at the veracity and figure, well, what is, which of this am I going to buy? Here's my take on the whole return on investment, what's it worth, schmear. First is you have to think, well, who, whose opinion do you care about? And I think it's your sponsor. It's whoever lets the funds go to fund your projects. Who signs the checks? And that you work with this sponsor about defining, well, what do we want to accomplish? What's important for people to be able to do or for people to become? And you agree on potential measures for that. And it has to be business metrics. It's not four levels. It's not smile sheets. It's things that relate to the profitability and sustainability of the organization. Those are the only things that are going to count. Well, maybe your sponsor's got a special bug, and you're, all right, you better pay attention to it since he or she is paying the bills. And you work with the sponsor throughout a program. Say, well, here's an update, not just surprise at the end. Sometimes that works fine, and you're ready to jump on to the next project. Sometimes the benefit of training is squished in with all the other stuff that was going on. So, you know, we learned about a new product for which there was an expensive advertising campaign for which we got an endorsement from somebody, not Tiger Woods. Uh, it's, you know, it was a special focus at the sales meeting. It's a great product, blah, 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 blah. Well, you don't throw up your hand and say, well, we can't identify the benefit. No, you have to dig in a different way. And I would suggest, I have a background in public opinion polling, that you interview a sample of people, a few people in depth. Where did you learn this? How did you learn this? How much time did you spend on it? Did you repeat this part? Did you use this part? Da, 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 da. And then extrapolate from the value to those individuals to what's the value to the whole organization. I go nuts when I hear that, well, you must manage, well, the, the saying is that, you know, what, what gets measured gets managed. And I say that you must manage what you can't measure. And in fact, I'll point out that the, usually the more somebody is paid in an organization, the more they are paid to deal without measurement, to use their discretion, their judgment, their past experiences, uh, 
you, you don't make you know a selection of new senior people or board members with a bunch of numbers and you don't take new strategic direction just built on a bunch of numbers uh, it's immeasurables that require really good business decision making I've been leading a lot of workshops lately and they're on these topics of how do we bring this into our organization and we usually end up with everybody giving an elevator pitch for something that they think their organization could do so they've got maybe 30 seconds senior person walks in the elevator and they have to say well here's what we're thinking of doing and here is numerically the return we expect to get and can I get your support on that and we often videotape these and play them back for people to see because I'm I really want people to go out there and sell these ideas because that's the way they're going to prosper more and more training programs isn't going to get anybody a raise but a whole new initiative which brings in millions of dollars that might this is just a notion of a workscape which is looking at the whole system so that I don't have to tie each specific activity to each little bitty return I mean there are some things like you know who does an ROI and email anyway there's some things like building in spaces for conversations in your headquarters that you're going to have a payback but they're going to pay back overall not just program by program now I mentioned I have a white paper which is these thoughts most of which were cooked up in the last three days uh, if you can't tell this is a brand new presentation most of it anyway but you're welcome to download a copy of the paper and uh, if you've got suggestions feedback or if you don't buy part of it by all means let me know about that also there's uh, on my website which is jcross.com you'll find a, a page that's just loaded with resources on informal learning it contains about half the chapters in the book and some videos and some other stuff so if you want to keep on going please do and finally the Internet Time Alliance that's our news feed down there and you can see what a number of people are chewing on as far as putting this into practice in large organizations now at this point questions opinions I don't buy it I still think it's a fad what you know whatever uh, we've got a uh, few minutes left and we will deal with what you want to deal with okay Jay this is Greg and we're getting a ton of questions and I'm gonna call through them and maybe try to select some of the ones that maybe uh, cut more right to um, your, your, your comments um, here's one from Julie uh, quote since our it is our responsibility to educate others on this topic since this is our career what's the best way to educate our customers and clients on informal working and working smarter um, well the, the short answer is just do it um, I mean part of it is recognizing that there are great opportunities by dealing with these other audiences uh, the use of lightweight tools like Twitter or blogs can be incredibly productive now if you think say 15 years ago when we we're fooling around with interactive CD-ROMs and stuff if you wanted to test out an idea well it might set you back two or three hundred thousand dollars to put together a program and have people try it out you see if you got anything a lot of people didn't get anything <laughs> they got shown the door uh, but these days you can do a whole lot of experiments for free so I think of it like planting seeds you just sow a whole lot of them and then you nurture the ones that come up there's no reason that folks can't try 30 50 projects and if they get two or three that are winners hey that's worth it that's great culturally the organization has to tolerate failure uh, it's been said that you know if you want to innovate more you increase your rate of failure because you're doing more and more experiments so I say experiment 
and uh, support what works. Okay. Here, here's a, a compilation of questions. A number of questions have been posed about um, tracking informal learning's effectiveness. Um, which may be an oxymoron. I don't know. I'll, I'll defer to you on that, Jay. But uh, there's been a number of questions about how can I prove this is working to the organization, that, that sort of flavor. Y any comments on that, Jay? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, first, how can I prove any learning is working? It, you know, back to the school model where I think we, we got misdirected. Uh, treat everybody as kids. Grades are the most meaningless variable in the world. Outside of the school system, grades mean nothing. They don't relate to happiness, to wealth, to power, to anything. I mean, how can that be? Well, grades tend to reward individual regurgitation, whereas business tends to work with groups of people who are innovating on things. The guy in the picture is Andrew Carnegie. And I selected him as here's a guy who's born the tenth out of ten children in a, a terribly poor community in Scotland who emigrated as a boy to the United States and worked for the railroads and noticed the first sleeping cars and somehow convinced a bank to loan him money and he invested in sleeping cars and he parlayed that into other acquisitions and he ended up buying steel mills to build bridges and then other steel mills and by the time that he was ready to hang it up and go live in a castle in Scotland, he had formed the largest steel company in the world. J.P. Morgan bought it as U.S. Steel. Now, this is a hard guy to have part with his money because he's, you know, really worked his butt off. So I think, well, if I've got a project, I want to envision selling it to him selling it to Andrew Carnegie, because I can convince him to spend his hard-earned money on an initiative, he's going to weigh whether it's got the benefit to justify it or not. And it's, that's the way decisions are made. You cannot come up with valid measures of the benefit of training that are like on the money. It, it's not a science experiment. Well, I'll, I'll stop there. I could go for a long time, but you've got other questions, Greg. And we've got three minutes. <laughs> Two. Hey, Greg, did you want to ask another participant question, or you want us to move toward a, a final question and a close? You muted your mic. I wasn't sure where you are. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'll, I'll give Jay um, one more question, and then maybe you can ask him the final question, Steve, okay? Sure. Um, Jay, here's a question from Chris McLaren, and he's talking about if we're working towards a working smarter philosophy, what do you see as the obstacles for social networking gaining momentum as a platform to help embed and share the learning? Well, I'm a big fan of social networking, and uh, I, I think there are a lot of unfounded fears about implementing it. I mean, if you get beyond the we respect our people enough to think that they're going to come up with good ideas, then it's usually, oh, what if people trash the company online? Or what if they say dirty things? Or what if there's sexual harassment? Or, you know, on and on and on, and all these imagined things. If you look at Andy McAfee, he's now at MIT, was Harvard Business School, has a great book, uh, it's called, uh, what's it called? It's called Enterprise 2.0. And he's gone to more than 100 companies and talked to them. And, you know, he's never found examples of this sort of malicious behavior because a difference in having an internal system is that people have their names attached. The vandalism, the spam, that comes from people who don't have their names attached. And they hide under the cloak of anonymity when they create their, you know, crimes. But... Uh, it, it, it's make-believe. I mean, I frankly quote the Harvard Business School professor when that comes up and say, look, this is crazy, especially compared to the benefits. And I'll turn it over to you. Hey, this has been awesome. Uh, let's kind of bring all of this home 
And so as an instructional systems designer, you know, I look at this and informal learning is kind of hard to really, you know, put your grabs on because it's hard to measure, as you say, but that doesn't mean it's not important and we don't have to manage it. So how am I, though, to retool what I do so that I'm able to capitalize and be able to incorporate the informal learning in what I do as an instructional systems designer? Well, I, I think you've got to broaden your, your self-definition and your scope. I mean, you, you go to a whole lot of uh, conferences, ASTD, used to be able to go to training, go to the guild, go to wherever, and they say, oh, well, what you've got to do is talk the language of business, talk like a business person. Ah, oh, no, you've got to do more than that. You've got to be a business person. So if you see opportunities to help the organization prosper, to make more money, to be a better place to work, to keep people happier. Well, you do it. You don't say, oh, that's not my department. No, your department is the whole deal, and we're now responsible for helping our organizations any way we can. So, you know, I, I think people have to understand their business. I was at a, a large, I won't name them, Silicon Valley company talking with there are 35 heads of training, and I was saying this, and they said, well, we'd have to understand how the business works to do what you're saying. I said, well, damn straight. If you want to you know, progress in your career, of course you've got to know how the business works. So um, I, I leave it at that. Become a business person, not just an instructional designer. Uh, what, let's make this the very last question is whether or not the you're going to make your slides available. Some people have asked about that. You had some great data on there, and, and uh, so if so, we'll make them available, but the decision is yours. Uh, well, I'll, I'll make them available, and I'll put a link, now give me 20 minutes, to the slides on jcross.com, which would be real obvious. Okay, great. And we'll have those, of course, at the ISD Now pages. There's several ways to find us, and we'll make sure that those links are there as well. Uh, Greg, let me turn it over to you to, uh, to thank Jay. Jay, I just wanted to uh, thank you for sharing your time and, and your thoughts. Um, I, I, I think you added a lot of food for thought, and I really love your idea about being the business person because it seems like you know a lot of us are doing jobs now that never existed. So if, if we grow up thinking that we're going to be a widget maker and then widgets don't exist anymore, we're kind of pigeonholing ourselves. So, I, you know, you just gave us so much. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate you sharing this with us. Well, let me thank you guys for having me first up in your series and for giving me a platform to talk about something that I truly believe in. I mean, I, I talk with lots of companies and around the world on this topic because I think it's the way we got to go. So thank you. I have to say thanks to you for making this series possible. And we're going to look forward to more installments in this. So you can see the uh, uh, URL there on your screen to please visit us and we'll give you some updates on what what's in store for the ISD Now series. Most of all, though, I've got to thank you for asking some really insightful questions today. Uh, it's those kind of contributions that really help keep these webinars current and take them to the next level and make them relevant to you. So if you learned something today, there's one more thing you can do, and that is to tell us what you thought of today's presentation and how we can make ISD Now even better. And if there's something that uh, you'd love for us, someone you'd love to invite as a guest, then hey, let us know. If you've got some people out there you really respect and admire their work, then uh, please let us know and we'll see what we can do for you. Uh, another shout out to all you educators with us today. Thanks for making the world a little smarter place. I'm Steve Hardiman for the ISD program at my alma mater, UMBC. We learn better together, so be part of our next webinar. We'll see you then for ISD Now. <laughs>